thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. Why does the weary world rejoice? For yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. And what do we do in response to God saving us through Jesus? We fall on our knees. Christmas Coastal Church. Great to see you. How many of y'all were singing along with that, right? Yeah, we're gonna, I think we're going to sing that on Christmas Eve, so I hope you'll join us. Get your Bible out. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we're doing a four-part Christmas series uh, called A Thrill of Hope, and the idea is we want to look at how the Old Testament promises for a coming Messiah are fulfilled in Christ. So while you're getting your Bible out, Matthew 1, get your note sheet out, a couple things. First of all, parents, I'm blown away by how many kids you entrust with us every week. So thank you for bringing your children to Coastal Church, and I hope that they go home. I hope you're encouraged. They're learning about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what you're teaching at home is, is being reinforced here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen? And uh, secondly, I'm really thankful if you volunteer in children's ministry. So make sure you thank a volunteer on the way out today, right? They do great work. And uh, how many of you were worried that the Advent wreath was going to get knocked over and we we're going to have flames abroad, right? Listen, we take bold risks for the gospel at Coastal, okay? Just know that. And uh, I was thinking the same thing. I started thinking liabilities. Terry, I know you think about liabilities too, right? That's, all the insurance people are like, I think about liabilities. So, uh, yeah, so thank you volunteers. And really, it's an advertisement. We always can use volunteers as well. So uh, God is blessed. I mean, that's our future. Amen. And uh, man, that, if you want to volunteer with our student and children ministry, uh, we can always use help. Thank you, volunteers that do that. And thank you, parents, for entrusting us with your kids. A couple quick announcements um, I want to highlight before I jump in this morning. First, is our gift guide. A lot of times in the month of December, people want to be generous uh, because we have a generous God and Christmas reminds us of that. And so we always produce a gift guide of, hey, here's some things if you want to give. These aren't our normal things that we highlight at Coastal, but uh, this year we're highlighting mostly our international missions and places that we're encouraging the gospel go all around the world. So if you want to pick up a gift guide, you can see where you can give to that. Uh, secondly, next weekend, is our food ministry. We're going to be doing our Christmas giveaway as well. If you want to provide a gift for a family that can't provide Christmas for their family, we have our angel tree on the back. You can still grab a tag. You guys have blown me away with how many gifts you've given, and we're going to be giving those out through the ministries of Coastal, one of them being the food ministry, and we're going to do that next week. And then after the new year, uh, we are going to be starting spiritual formation classes, and we do these all the way up to the launch of our next small group series. And so uh, you can pick up this book, and these, there's a class to help grow you in the Lord and to know more about Christ. And so if you want to pick one of these up, see the classes that we're offering, that would be great. And there is a lot of great classes. And then finally, on your way out, this is an invite card to our Christmas Eve service. Man, I cannot encourage you. If you're a regular at Coastal, please pass out at least three of these, right? Take three, invite a neighbor, make some cookies for your neighbor, and put this on it, whatever, however you want to do that. Uh, but please, please invite. Here at the Yorktown campus, we have one, three, and five, and we have so many services over four campuses. It's going to be really exciting Christmas Eve, but let's fill this place up three times. Let's worship uh, the, our, our, the birth of our Savior, Jesus. Amen? And invite a neighbor to hear that great, great news. All right, let's jump in this morning. Here we go. I, uh, I read this recently that Larry King, uh, the famous interviewer and talk show host, was once asked uh, if he could interview anyone in history who would it be? So Larry King, the interviewer, was asked, who could you, if you could interview someone, who would it be? And here was his answer. 
He said, I would love to interview Jesus Christ. The interviewer then asked a follow-up question to Larry King. They asked him, what would you ask Jesus Christ? This is a fascinating answer. Larry King said, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. The answer to that question would define history for me. Now, uh, to my knowledge, Larry King never became a follower of Jesus Christ, never called himself a Christian, but one of the things that he understood was the real Christmas story and its impact and meaning on Christianity and all of history. You see, all other religions in the world are what I would call a top-down religion. All other religions in the world is a deity that rules from the top down, making the rules and demanding of its worshipers. But Christi to embrace Christianity is to embrace the virgin birth. It's to embrace the virgin conceiving a child, the God of the universe, nursing and fragile and growing up and suffering as we suffer and dying as we die, only to live again and to reign forever. It is Christianity that reverses the order of all other worldviews and religions. And I appreciate that Larry King at least recognized that the claims of Christianity are extremely unique, and if true, they are history-altering. Amen? And so if you're here this morning and you call yourself a Christian, you believe in something that's miraculous, and life and history altering. So this morning we want to look at that. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Here's where we're going to start. Follow along with me. But as he considered these things, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to that phrase in a minute. The he there is Joseph. As Joseph considered these things, and we're going to talk about what it was he was considering, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying... Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So point number one, the Bible teaches us that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Miraculous. Now let's back up. Let me give you a little context. The context around the phrase that, that, that begins verse 20, but as he considered these things. What is it that Joseph was considering? Well, Joseph was a holy man. He was a biblical man. He was a just man, and he was betrothed to Mary. And we see that in verse 18. So if you have your Bible open, you can back up. All right, verse 18, Matthew writes, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, okay? And so this is giving us some context. Now, at this moment, in verse 18, Joseph does not know, an angel has not yet appeared to him and said, hey, this is the Holy Spirit, the work of God. At this point, all he knows is Mary is pregnant, and it's in their betrothal period. Now, betrothal is, is similar in our culture to engagement, it was, but it also has, uh, in some ways, stronger ties than our cultural engagement. They weren't married yet, so they hadn't consummated their honeymoon. However, to break off a betrothal did require a certificate of divorce. And so if during the betrothal, a woman like Mary were to come pregnant and it wasn't from the person she's betrothed to, according to the Old Testament, Joseph actually could have had Mary put to death. Deuteronomy 22. But Joseph is a kind man and he's gracious and he's merciful. And he did not want to shame Mary nor have her put to death. So now we look at verse 19, verse 19 of Matthew 1. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Okay? And so that's where we come to verse 20, where he's considering these things. He's thinking about, man, how do I, in a, in a 
quiet way. I don't want to harm Mary. It's not my baby, but I don't want to harm her. How do I divorce her or put her away quietly as to not make a big scandal? And when the angel appears to him, he, he, there's, he, the angel says there's something quite unique happening here, Joseph, and it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, which we'll come to in a minute. So now with all that context, let me give you a couple reasons why it's important that Jesus be conceived by the Holy Spirit and be born of a woman or be born of a virgin. So letter A, the virgin birth reminds us that salvation from sin can only come from God, okay? You and I need to be saved from our sin, and it is not something we can do on our own. We need divine intervention. And so the virgin birth, Larry King had this right, is to remind us, one, that it's miraculous, and therefore it reminds us that we need God to intervene. You cannot earn back God's favor. In order for you to go to heaven, it's not, man, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. To go to heaven, you have to be perfect. And since none of us are perfect, there's no way to earn back perfection by being good enough going forward. We, we can't work for it. We can't save ourselves. And so the virgin birth and its miracle reminds us that we need God to intervene on our behalf. Amen? If you're here today and you're a Christian, the beginning point of you being a Christian is, I'm needy, I'm broken, I'm sinful, I, I need God to intervene on my behalf. And so as we look into the manger at this Christmas season and we're reminded and we sing about the virgin birth, we are reminding ourselves that God intervened on our behalf. Amen, church? Secondly, theologically speaking, so this first point is very theological. Letter B. The virgin birth assures Jesus does not have the inherited sin of Adam. It was theologically important that Jesus not have a sin nature so that he could be an acceptable sacrifice for our sin. Not just any old sacrifice would do. It would have to be a sinless, perfect sacrifice. The Apostle Paul talks about this theologically in 2 Corinthians 5 when it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay? So when I talk about, hey, for you to go to heaven, you have to be perfect, which none of us is and none of us ever will be. What we need is the perfection of Christ gifted to us and the way that happens is by grace through faith when we re repent of our sin and we say you know what god you have sent your son to save me i believe that jesus is your rescue plan for my soul we get credited the perfection of christ freely to our spiritual bank account if you will this is the great and glorious doctrine called justification we, are, we stand declared righteous in the presence of a holy God by grace alone, through faith alone, because of the person and the work of Jesus. Amen? And so he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Why is it that we have to instruct our children, right? Why is it that your wife, men, sometimes say, he's acting just like you? She's right, by the way, Okay. Because sin is inherited, right? And so I, my kids act like me. I act like my dad who acts like his dad's 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 dad, dad's 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 dad, dad's 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 dad, dad, all the way back to Adam, right? And so Adam fell, but Christ being conceived by the Holy Spirit does not have the inherited sin of Adam. Therefore, he's an acceptable sacrifice for our sin. Everybody got that? All right, let us see. Being born of a woman ensures that Jesus was also human so he's conceived by the holy spirit therefore he's god and he's sinless but he's born of a woman taking on flesh making sure he's also human why is that important that's important because our savior who walked this planet knows what you're going through he's not a disinterested distant i wound up the universe god and now i'm just going to step back and let things fall as they may no our god entered in 
to our mess. Isn't that great news? And so Jesus is, as God, a sufficient and acceptable sacrifice. And as human, he relates perfectly to you and I. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But Jesus Christ, theologically speaking, is the God-man. 100% God, 100% human, and that is theologically important for our salvation. The second thing I want you to see this morning is the name that the angel gives to Joseph to name his son. And it's point number two, that Jesus saves from sin. Matthew 121, the angel says, she will bear a son, talking about Mary, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sin. Jesus literally means to save. In the movie, The Last Emperor, the young child is anointed to be the last emperor of China. And he lives a life of luxury, thousands of servants. At his command, they do whatever they he asks them to do. Well, one day his his brother comes up to him and he says, well, what happens when you do wrong? What happens when you do something wrong? And this young boy who's anointed to be the next emperor, he says, when I do wrong, someone else actually gets punished. And to, and to demonstrate, he takes a jar and he slams it on the ground and he breaks it. And at that moment, one of his servants is beaten for his indiscretion. Christianity is the exact opposite. Jesus reversed this ancient pattern. When the servants err, it is the king who is punished. When you do wrong as a Christian, Christ bore the punishment of your sin. One of the things that even concerns my own soul, I, I, I think my mom brought me to church when I was two weeks old, right? And I've been in church ever since. I always say, I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church. And so, you know, it's just what it was. And so I've heard the gospel message since I can remember. And if that's kind of your story, right, and you grew up and you're kind of a longtime Christian, like sometimes I think that, 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 that the Christmas story and the gospel message potentially loses its wow factor. Man, longtime Christian, never be wowed that your king took the punishment that you deserve. And as I was meditating on this this week, it just kind of brought tears to my eyes, like, God, thank you so much. Where would I be if you and I had not intervened for my sin? Jesus took on flesh in order to save us from our sin. And what's fascinating is the angel declares this to Joseph from the beginning, to which I'm sure Joseph and Mary passed this on to Christ, but Christ from the very beginning, understood that he was here on a mission. Listen, we do twinkly lights and, you know, nice Christmas tree decorations and we give gifts, but for Christ, his birth was in the shadow of suffering and the cross. He knew what the mission was with his name. He was reminded every single day as people called out his name, Jesus, which means to save. He knew that that was a mission of suffering and difficulty for him. Behind his birth is ultimately the mission to pay the penalty of our sin. Jesus came to save him. By the way, the angel said to save his people. Well, who are his people? Number three, who are his people? Who are his people that Jesus came to save? Who are the people Jesus came to save? You know, I love, uh, you know, Christmas story in Matthew 2 and 1 and 2 and Luke 2. You know, twinkly lights and shepherds and manger scenes, and angels breaking through the sky. But, but John takes a different approach to Christmas. John, John's theological. He doesn't care about white lights and Christmas gifts, right? He cares about theology, right? So, and I love that about John. And this is what John says about the birth of Christ. John chapter 1, verse 12. Who are those who Jesus, who did he come to save? But to all who did receive him. How do we receive him? Who believed in his name. Listen, when you receive Christ and you believe that Jesus is God's rescue plan, are you ready for this? You then get some rights. 
You know what your rights are? To become the children of God. In Christ, you are one of his kids, right? Who were born not of of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John chapter 3, and dealing with Nicodemus, what does Jesus say? If you want to see the kingdom of God, you need to be what? Anybody know? You got to be born again, right? That's That's not... That's not 70s evangelism gone bad, okay? That's, that, that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus said. Our souls and our hearts and our minds need a spiritual rebirth, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, that when we repent of our sin and we believe that Jesus is who the Scriptures say are, we are now given the right to become the children of God. Who did Jesus come to save? Those who believe in him. Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what, church? What does it say? Lord, right? By the way, Lord is a positional word. It's not a last name. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, Christ is not a last name. Jesus means to save. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one, the special one sent sent from God. And the Lord means it's a position that Christ, Jesus Christ, in our hearts and in our lives and in our minds has taken up the position of being the boss, right? So by the way, one of the things I love about baptism, which we, man, we had a couple a lot of baptism, two straight services of baptisms a couple weeks ago, man, it's incredible. These folks are standing in front of us and declaring with their mouth and their action through baptism, Jesus is my Lord. I used to live for myself, but I'm now living for Jesus. So let's go back to Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what, church? Saved. Now I want to add something here. I want to add to Scripture. I want to add to your understanding. Because, again, a lot of times we use the word saved, and we don't know what we're... What do we, well, I didn't know I need saving, okay? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What will you be saved from? You will be saved from the penalty of your sin. Your sin has earned you something, according to the Scriptures. The wages of sin is what? Is death, right? Now, there's physical death, but the Scriptures also teach there's a second death, a separation eternally from our Creator, and it's going to be horrible and awful, but God in His grace has sent His one and only Son, and those who say, I'm a sinner, I need saving, and I believe, oh God, that you have sent Jesus as your rescue plan, When we can, and, and, and you are now the ruler and boss of my life. When that happens, you believe in your heart that God did the miracle of virgin birth and raising from the dead when you believe that you are saved from the penalty of your sin isn't that great news in some ways it's really simple in fact there's probably someone here this morning or someone tuned in online like it can't be that simple it really is here's the tough part it's quite humbling you cannot do it on your own and most of us are so full of pride like it can't be that easy and i think that's what Spencer was telling us as he's leading us in worship, like, let's not forget the simplicity of Christmas and the gospel. Yep, you know what? It starts with, it's not about me. I need help. And God has saved us. And when we do that, who is it the people he came to save? Those who repent of their sins and believe in him. That's who he came to save. That can be you this morning. Listen, if you're a longtime Christian, never let the simplicity of it lose your heart and mind. In some ways, it's really, really simple. In some ways, it's really, really profound. If you're here this morning, you're joining us online, you're joining us in person, you came just because you, you know, your grandkid was singing or your nephew or niece was singing, like, I'm so glad you're here. But listen, here's what I have for you. The, Jesus loves you, and he came to save you from the penalty of your sin, and it really is as simple as, I'm a sinner, and I need saving. And when you receive Christ, who is it that he's came to save? Those who receive him, they are gifted the right to become the very, very children of God. And if you're a child of God, you are well looked after. Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. Final thing I want you to see this morning is Christmas foretold, number four. Christmas foretold. I want you to see that that Christmas is not willy-nilly. 
This isn't something that just kind of happened 2,000 years ago. This was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, and this is what, the, what, what had been spoken by, through the prophet Isaiah, which we're going to look at in a minute. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, what's it mean, church? God with us. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. The virgin birth of Christ, besides being theologically important, which of course it is, it's also important because it fulfilled what God had promised through the prophet Isaiah. It's not like some kind of cosmic accident. There's this, there's this plan. Galatians said when it's just when it was just the right time, in God's perfect timing. The birth of Christ, which had been planned before the foundation of the world to save the fall of man. God set his plan into motion. And I got great news for you. None of the enemies of God can stop what God is doing. Like, it's not even close. If you remember when we did our stand series, we looked at Genesis chapter 3. And, and um, there, as God was cursing the serpent in Genesis 3 he said something really important. Check this out. So I, I just want you to see like the kind of the, the, the sprinkling of this plan of God starts all the way in Genesis. As God is cursing the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, there's a really, I, I really need all your eyes here. This is a really important theological truth here that if you don't understand, you need to come see me afterwards. But the important theological truth is basically this. Snakes are gross, okay? And everybody should know that. So if you have a pet, one of those, you need to come see me, all right? You're violating the curse, all right? I, they're just gross. All right. So I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What's happening here? God is saying that the seed of the woman in his grand plan, which finds its fulfillment at Christmas time, will crush the head of the serpent. The resurrection of Christ defeats all of the enemies of God, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the final fulfillment, according to Corinthians 15, is when Christ finally returns Fully and finally, the second advent, first advent, Christmas, second advent is when he fully and finally rules. The final enemy, death, will be finally defeated. Amen? Okay? And so the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. In other words, Satan will be defeated by God through the offspring of the very one that Satan deceived. Isn't that just like God? To take something broken and turn it on its head so he gets more praise and glory, right? And so some of you are sitting here this morning, you're like, man, God could never use me if you only knew my past and things I've done. Listen, once you repent and follow Jesus and make him Lord, he takes the sin and shame of your brokenness, he turns it on his head to give him more glory. Isn't that great news? That's what God does. And so all the way back in Genesis 3, he says, through the woman, I'm going to win. And then in Isaiah 7, just to make it a little bit clearer, he says this, Therefore the Lord himself, verse 14 of Isaiah 7, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Okay, whenever the Bible says, I'm going to give you a sign, you need to perk up, right? He did it to the shepherds, by the way, remember? Luke chapter 2, there will be a sign unto you. What's the sign? You will find a babe wrapped in, claw, in rags in a feeding trough. That's a pretty cool sign. And what do the shepherds do in Luke 2? We should hurry up and go see what this is. That's what they say. Like, no kidding. Duh. You know, like, angel shows up, says there'll be a baby in a dog dish. Go. Okay, go. That's really cool. Okay. This will be a sign. Of, this one's equally shocking. Okay. This will be a sign. The Lord himself will give a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what, church? Emmanuel. Pretty amazing, isn't it? 
And so the promise finds its fulfillment when the angel appears to Joseph in a dream and he sa and says, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. God says, I've been doing this since before I created the world. This thing I was going to do that's going to blow your minds. For the foundation of the world, he chose you to worship him and love him and live for him. And all this was spoken took place that the Lord had spoken through the prophet. And we will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. God set foot on this planet. I remember years ago, when I was a kid, my mom um, lost her diamond. Her diamond had popped out of the setting on her wedding ring. And I, and I, don't, I don't remember all of it, but I, I remember like my parents looking everywhere. I was pretty young at the time. I remember them vacuuming the whole house and then taking the vacuum bag and ripping it open and going through the lint and the dust and the dirt all to find this, this uh, at that point I wish my, my dad probably wished he had spent more money and gotten a bigger one right so he could easier to find but uh, you know so going through the dust they didn't find it. I remember them going through all the trash bags of that whole week with all of them looking digging through the trash to find this this precious stone and then they, I remember my dad undoing the drain traps of every single sink, trying to see if that stone was in the drain trap. I remember them looking into the toilets to see. And so finally, after I think they had resolved that the diamond um, was lost, and then they just figured, I don't know what the plan was. I'm too young to know. I should ask them, like, were you going to buy another one? What was the plan? I don't know. But I remember months later, uh, my mom had in her, in her pantry uh, a treat jar that had candies in it, and she went into that candy jar, and, and it was Smarties. Anybody remember Smarties, like little thing? They still make Smarties? They still make them? Yeah. And so I remember, and so, you know, we're a pretty smart family, so we nicknamed that the Smarty Jar. And so, and so I remember that she was in the Smarty Jar, and lo and behold, what did she find in the bottom of that Smarty Jar? No, no. It was her diamond. I'm just kidding. She did. So. <laughs> Emmanuel, God with us. I mean, God's greatest gift, more precious than a diamond, in a feeding trough, in a barn, with no medical technology. The one who created the world the most precious gift God could give us, born of a teenage girl who'd never had kids before, born of a virgin, surrounded by scandal. So much so, Joseph was going to put her away quietly. There's whispers of infidelity and grossness. Everything that could go wrong and would look gross and insignificant, and let's put this in a corner to make sure no one hears about it. That's how the Creator entered the world. And John says it this way, and the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there is the word tabernacle. Literally, it means he pitched his tent and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And since God is indeed one of us, since he has indeed become one of us and taken on flesh, this, this changes everything. This God of the Bible, he's not just a rule giver. He didn't just set the world in motion, your world in motion, with all its struggles and challenges and difficulties. He didn't just do all that and say, oh, have at it, best of luck to you. No, this God, he walked in our shoes. He lived where we live. He hurt like we hurt. I was talking to my daughter yesterday. We were talking about Joseph. She goes, you know, there's no really mention of Joseph much past the early parts of the Gospels. I said, yeah, a lot of scholars think he died. And my daughter contemplated that for a moment. I said, you know what's really cool about that? Is anybody in this room that's lost a family member, lost a dad, grew up without a parent, Jesus knows what it's like to do that. 
He's hurt as you hurt. He knows your difficulties. Isaiah the prophet says this, he was despised and he was rejected by men. Have you ever been rejected by a dear friend? Jesus knows what it's like to go through that. He's a man of sorrows. Have you ever, at the Christmas season, carried sorrows? He was acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces and was despised. He, and we esteemed him not. Jesus is not someone that was super popular. In fact, every time he got popular, he said things crazy like, hey, if you want to follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it was like, what? And off they went, right? He, he, he kind of scorned popularity. Hebrews 4 says that this Jesus that we worship, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Church, the God of the Bible is not a distant, disinterested God. He's a God who loves and cares for you. Christmas is ultimately a love story. The God of the universe saying, I loved you enough to set aside my kingly garb and show you my love. God is and was indeed one of us. He walked the earth like one of us, had sorrows, pains, joys, lived like one of us. He came to have a relationship with you. My question to you is how will you respond to him? Maybe you're here this morning. You are a longtime Christian. And let me encourage you, it is easy to let the mystery and the message of the gospel, which means good news, to just kind of roll over us and we kind of walk in the corporate words and we walk out and we're somewhat disinterested. Never lose the wonder of how much God in Christ loves you. When we sing, I want you to engage with heart and mind and voice and say, I am going to worship through song. When we go out of these doors and we live, let's live in holiness and righteousness this week with integrity, giving full attention to our souls and our lives, being developed to be more and more like our King, who was a humble, serve, righteous servant. Let's develop to be more like him. And if you're here this morning and, or you're tuning in online and you don't know Christ, you don't know God, God loves you. How much? Peer in the manger. He took on flesh, he lived the life you couldn't, he died in your place, he rose again, authenticating his claims to being the Messiah. And anyone who says, I'm a sinner and I need saving and believes that Jesus is who he says he is, you are saved from the penalty of your sin. Amen. You know, as Larry King astutely noted, the question born of a virgin, if true, that indeed defines all of history. I'll take it a step further. Since it is true, it can define your life as you repent of sin and follow Jesus. I hope you'll do that this morning. Amen, church? Amen. All right, I want to invite the prayer team up right now. I know everybody's looking around. I know it's always nerve-wracking. Listen, if you're here and you ever come to one of our corporate services and you need prayer, these men and women are always here for you. Okay, they love to pray with you and talk with you. They're always up on their screen. There's also somebody in our prayer chapel on the way out. Always, always have prayer before you leave, okay? If you ever come in and you're like, man, I want to know what it means to follow Jesus. I, I don't know what that, what that looks like. And you want to talk to someone, they are also equipped to share with you. They'll open the Bible with you and go, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We'd love for you to know him today. So don't leave here today if the Holy Spirit's working on your heart without talking to somebody and saying, I want to follow Jesus. Amen, church? All right, let's pray, and then we are going to go out singing our new song. This is a great song that reminds us to worship our God in the simplicity of a gospel message. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these incredible people who came here this morning to, to worship you be reminded of the incredible message of the gospel. They've came here engaged and enthusiastic. And God, we, we, your people, are really, really grateful for how much you've loved us in Christ. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't yet know you, God, I pray that today they would say, you know what? I'm a sinner. I need saving. I receive Christ today. I believe. Jesus died for my sins. He rose again. And I want him to be the boss of my life. I follow him today. Father, as followers of you, 
Your word says that if we don't praise you, the rocks will praise you. So for this week, God, the rocks can be quiet. And we are people, we are going to stand and we are going to praise you for the incredible gift, born of a virgin, to fulfill what the prophet had said, God with us. We praise you for that incredible gift. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go out singing this morning. Thank you.